earthquakes we've been having uh, maybe come up to about a kilometre below ground surface and so this is this Kaiapoi fault here, a bit further north from where we were um, seeing the recent earthquakes. That's got some indication of some very small movement of the six to nine million year old volcanic rocks. It's got no expression higher up into the sequence. Well, it's got some expression up to um, a bit higher in the sequence. Our most recent earthquakes were occurring in this section here and you can see that the, all of the layers go through here very, very smooth. If there is a fault in there, it's got tiny, tiny amounts of movement because it can't be detected with the resolution we can get out of this, which is pretty good. It would see a few metres of movement. So the, move, the, the earthquake we've just had off there is not a very frequently repeated one, otherwise we would see disruption of some of these lakes. So very rare event. The other thing here is that the earthquakes, the aftershocks we're having, are down at sort of eight kilometres depth. Now if this is three kilometres, if we could extend the section, we'd be down here at eight kilometres, and you can see how much more faulting there is in these old rocks. It's been through a really hard life, so once you've had an earthquake, then the earthquakes are going to settle down and release stresses across many of these small faults, probably. So that's why there's a, a, a sequence of earthquakes will occur after the big earthquake as you redistribute the stresses that have been caused by that earthquake. So those are very expectable. They're occurring way down here at about eight kilometres depth. Only the very biggest of the earthquakes would rupture all the way up through here, and that tells us more about these magnitude sevens than sixes. Okay, so I think that's, that's really the context here, this line goes across where the December earthquakes were occurring, um, we can't see them. So we can only say that the events that we have been having, having are very rare events. They, where the next ones are going to be, well that's an obvious question, uh, don't really know. The tendency is to migrate towards the east. We don't think there's a big fault out there to, directly to the east. They may go to the north, they may go back, to the, back down to the western end, or sooner or later they will stop. So I think that's really what we were... We could come back to some of those if we uh, want to, to answer some more details. Okay. So what you've been giving us there is that kind of great big seismometer overview and it was some of this not as easy to penetrate as the bedrock was with your radar potentially. So what I want to do is in a moment or two just go to some questions off the floor but I think we've got a microphone which is working. In fact I'll get you to come up to the podium and just address a couple of things. I just want you to put it uh, again as much as you can and I know it's it's difficult but as much as you can in a relatively simple context. What I'm hearing you say is that the earthquakes that are now occurring off the coast are occurring in rock that is pretty fragmented, that that fragmentation of itself therefore means that it's not likely to produce the big significant earthquakes of our nightmares, that it's much more likely to be maybe a 5, 5.5 and then a decreasing sequence. Have I got that part right? Yeah, I think... Come um, over here. Thank you. The, there is always a chance that these other structures, as we've seen, they can join up a little bit in some of the biggest structure. The, the talk was that the Kaiapoi Fault as it's been now observed, if you join the little pieces together, it could be up to 25 or 30 kilometres long. That would be consistent with a maximum magnitude of about seven out there. We don't see that structure, we don't see that anywhere near where the earthquakes are occurring at the moment. And from those depth sections, we can see it hasn't happened in the past. So our guidance on that is that therefore it will not, in that, small area produce the, the six and a half or seven. Um, if, the, if the earthquakes were to migrate further away, they could migrate, of course, onto some of these other uh, known structures that we know that have produced, very rarely, these larger earthquakes in the past. 
but the expectation over the next little while in that area will be that we'll go into the same sort of decay sequence that we've seen post-February and post-June is that there will still be, there will almost certainly still be a five out there would be my guess. There will be quite a few fours and we're, we're, we're still feeling threes on a daily basis. That will go on for a time but it will slowly uh, diminish. Um, whether it rejuvenates again, so we, uh, post, post September we thought okay we've had a big earthquake, we'll go through just a very simple aftershock decay sequence and then we'll go back to an old background. Six months later we had this rejuvenation event. We've had two or three or four of these now so if that's the behaviour of how the earthquakes are going to occur in, in Christchurch in Canterbury going forward then we'll, it'll die away there is a possibility of a rejuvenation event somewhere. It won't, it won't re-rupture the fault lines that have already had their big earthquake. That, that, and, and so the feeling is that a lot of those have been very concentrated on the city, so further large earthquake activity is liable to be further away from the city because we've released a lot of the stress that's really proximal to the city. So when you talk about... Um you, you, were, you were saying earlier on, you know, we just happened to be at the wrong time in history, I yes. suppose, was your reference. Is that, is that uh, telling me that I'm in a sequence which continues to be on the wrong side of history for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 or 50 years? Can you give us a feeling for what we might be able to expect over the next decade or two, or is that just simply impossible? Um, it's, it's a really difficult question, this, um, this forecast, accurately. What we have seen from some other calculations from the scientific community is that the stresses imposed uh, from the Darfield earthquake might be a perturbation of the order of 30 years. Now, that's to say that you've disturbed the background for a period of several decades, um, we can also look at other parts of the world or other parts of New Zealand and we can look at the northwest Nelson region. You look at Murchison through Anangahua through Westport um, over a period of quite some time. They were a sequence of earthquakes in an area that doesn't normally have earthquakes either um, but they were often a long period between and they didn't reoccur in the same place. It moved around. Um, so I think that's coming back to the same thing that's that Christchurch's city has, probably, has had a lot of um, earthquake activity, a lot of the stress must be released in the Christchurch city area, um, but for Canterbury there may well be an ongoing, ongoing sequence. Um, um, over a period of a few decades, when you look at the detail of Northwest Nelson now, actually there's still some remnant earthquakes happening there from the Anangahura earthquake. Now, when you say stop, well, they don't stop, but they're in Anangahua, they're still there, but they're not really detectable, and they're not worrying people about getting on with their lives. Um, so we're progressing into a period where I think that, uh, well, this current earthquake, I think, has been uh, damaging to people's... Um, um, confidence, dam damaging probably mentally rather than physically. There's been relatively little physical damage in the, in the city or in the region, but of course it occurred at the wrong time of the year and I think these are very upsetting events rather than being dangerous or damaging events. Can you therefore give us a feeling for Christchurch compared to some of the other centres uh, around New Zealand? I mean, it, what we've been experiencing here and the, uh, I guess, the potential for f future events. Are we significantly now more liable to get these than other centres in New Zealand, or are we just at a, a higher level, which is more equivalent to some of the places that have traditionally been seen as potential centres for more earthquake activity? Yeah. Right now, I think, uh, Stephen, we would be well above Wellington activity rates right now. Um, but say just a month or two ago when we're getting back to quite a quiet time before Christmas that's probably back to something that's quite akin to Wellington but we do need to watch out for these rejuvenation events which might go on for a while but as we've seen through 
um, the geotechnical work and through the work of the Department of Building and Housing, future activity at a modest level further away from the city does not inhibit the reconstruction or the rebuilding or moving forward. Um, interestingly, I don't think these most recent events have been a significant insurance event. Nobody is too concerned about this most recent event from an insurance point of view. So, so finally, just from me before we go to uh, everybody out here, the rejuvenation events, by rejuvenation event, you mean an earthquake of what, around a 5, 5.5 level? And uh, so what does that mean? And do, do they actually continue to move out or do rejuvenation events still have the potential to be uh, occurring close into the city? Um, I think at the five and five and a half level, they're really hard to say that they could not occur in the city. I think that the six and larger events are more liable to be further away. Um, the rejuvenation, there's one, I don't know whether it's worth pulling out, one of the diagrams we can show that while we've been thinking here in Canterbury that we've had an awful lot of earthquakes, when we look at the statistics of those earthquakes, the early two weeks or so has been very, very productive, but actually they've tailed away quite, quite quickly. And when we look at a global average of how a long-term aftershock sequence should occur, the, um, the productivity of the aftershocks has fallen behind until we've had these rejuvenation events. So we're working on some of these statistics at the moment. I was thinking of not that one, but the other, the cumulative one. Sorry, Stephen. Um, when we look at the, the, the whole package now, post-September, we're starting to look like we've filled up the expected number of aftershocks, getting towards it with a fairly large uncertainty. But for a while, post-September, we were a long way, and this is with hindsight, we were quite a long way behind the expected number of earthquakes. We're now catching up to the number of expected earthquakes. So uh, in, in one sense, that is good news. That is good news. Because you're accounting yeah. for what some people were describing as the lost or missing energy. Yes. That has now been expressed in a series of earthquakes. That's right. So you would expect that over the coming months, our uh, potential for these sorts of events statistically is going to significantly decline to a background level which is more akin to a much broader area of yeah, New Zealand. Or being in an Angahua Junction or in Murchison or something like that. Okay. Um, this is the plot I was thinking of. Um, <laughs> Stephen, I was hoping you were going to talk to this. <laughs> the blue line is the um, average aftershock expectancies. Okay, over a long period of time, well, over a period of time, and this is just a number, what we've had and this is some um, uncertainty on that. The, this is not, you know, the, there's always uncertainty um, or variability about what is average, okay? So this is some sort of estimate of the uncertainty about the expected number. This is the numbers that we have had, okay? And this is post-September, and you see that there is a large gap in here. But these are the rejuvenation events, and you can see that we're starting to plot those towards the expected number. And so, we've, of course, we haven't been able to do that until we've had all of the earthquakes to actually analyse. So it's, it's not until now have this, this sort of analysis uh, been possible to get into. But you can see that our red line is converging on the expected number. And that is a, that's a, a, that, that's a good, news. good news. Yeah, It doesn't mean to say the earthquakes are going to stop. I think we'll produce um, some of the probability numbers again uh, by the end of the month, and I think we can guarantee, sorry to say, guarantee that there will still be fives in, in, in the coming months. Now, where they're going to be, hopefully they're going to continue to be offshore, and they will be um, unfortunate when they occur at night and everybody's still got sleepless nights. That's um, terrible, but I don't think they'll be damaging if they maintain.